G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Experts. And today we've got a really cool topic to talk about because we're gonna be talking about hydrogen and hydrogen engines and hydrogen combustion and all that kind of stuff, which is fantastic because I think there's a lot of interest um, from a lot of people, um, especially, you know, there's a discussion of batteries, hybrids, you know, methanol, all this kind of stuff. Um, what does the future look like? So it's always fun to talk about, uh, you know, a topic which kind of gets into the, the future of combustion engines um, and, I have two people here, I'm going to let you guys can introduce yourselves, but um, from Afton Chemical, who are going to talk uh, all about hydrogen and who have kind of like dedicated the last few years of their careers to actually understanding uh, hydrogen combustion and the lubricants that go along with hydrogen. So uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, Tara. Sure, I'm Tara Loosemore. Uh, I've been working at Afton for three years now. I'm working in the heavy duty R&D team, so I'm working on formulation for new projects products uh being diesel and hydrogen applications yeah awesome yes i'm alan henderson uh, i'm the regional marketing manager for engineers and fuels for afton uh, covering the emir region um i've been with afton for 12 years uh, i do actually have a chemistry background believe it or not so uh, it's, quite, it's quite frightening so uh, whenever anyone asks my chemistry question they're surprised there answer <laughs> it yeah. awesome awesome so maybe uh just to kind of set up the discussion uh first of all First of all, like why why are we having this discussion in the first place? Like why why hydrogen combustion of all things? To you know, as a future fuel, uh, why are we looking to hydrogen rather than, than anything else? Yeah, I think it's a great question, and what we um, I have to credit uh, someone else with this idea, but there was uh, the North American Council for Freight Efficiency came up with this term of the messy middle, and what they were talking about is right now, you know, when you look at where we are predominantly it's a diesel uh, environment um, commercial vehicle um, when you look to the future sort of out to maybe 2050 there is the the move to battery electric and we will see that electrification uh, pathway the period in the middle is going to be a period where we see uh, a huge amount of uh, uncertainty um, you know we need to think about range we need to think about um, uh, battery technology itself um, and in that middle period, there is legislation that's going to force truck manufacturers, you know, the CO2 limits, particularly in Europe, where they're very stringent, um, it's going to be difficult to meet that um, without doing something different from uh, what they're doing today. Uh, and we believe hydrogen's got a part to play in that. Um, and certainly many of the major OEMs across the world share that view and are investing heavily in exploring hydrogen. And then I guess hydrogen comes in two forms, right? So you've got hydrogen combustion versus you know, everyone would have heard of like the cell kind of technology. So this discussion, I think, is primarily hydrogen combustion. So what are the, what are the advantages of doing that versus a kind of like a fuel cell? Well, a fuel cell uh, is more efficient than a combustion engine, but it has other drawbacks as well that maybe wouldn't want you to go towards a combustion engine. So benefits of going combustion is that you can use an existing diesel engine and retrofit it to work with a hydrogen fuel. Um, it can use much more impure hydrogen to, with fuel cell, there's very low tolerance for impurities in the hydrogen. There's, there's also a, a, the cost of ownership. Um, is, is, so for a hydrogen ICE, the cost of ownership is very much dictated by the cost of the hydrogen itself. For a fuel cell, that'll be true as well. But you've also got the cost of the battery. Um, and so um, the, the payback period at the moment for a fuel cell is, is too long to make it worthwhile. I'm sure future may get there, but at the moment, the economics don't stack up. Um, for hydrogen ICE, it, it, it is just down to that cost of fuel. So actually it's a short mid-term solution, but it actually makes a lot of sense. So I think combustion engines are sort of like a well-known thing as well. I guess it comes with the advantages of if you transition a fleet from diesel to hydrogen, mm. you know, all the same mechanics that worked on a standard reciprocating engine will also presumably be able to work on the hydrogen engine with a couple of like changes, right? Um, so then what makes hydrogen unique, right? From a combustion standpoint, like, so we, we combust all kinds of different fuels in reciprocating engines, whether it's, uh, you know, obviously petrol and diesel are the main ones, but, you know, you start to get into the gases, right? Natural gas um, uh, uh, combustion as well. So what makes hydrogen different to those kind of fuels? And then how does that then start to affect some of the decisions we make around the oil chemistry? So if you compare hydrogen 
combustion characteristics to our usual diesel, gasoline, maybe compressed natural gas as well. Across the board, it is, tends to be a step change difference. So, uh, for example, the minimum emission energy for hydrogen is uh, order of magnitude lower compared to something like gasoline or diesel. And so that gives a lot more challenges around pre-ignition. And so now we have to think about that more in both uh, designing our engine and also designing our lubricant. Equally, we're no longer burning any carbon. We're only burning hydrogen. So we're getting a lot more water in our fuel, in our oil, in our whole engine. And so we have to deal with that, protecting the surfaces, dealing with emulsion. What we don't want is water getting into the oil, separating out the bottom and then getting picked up by the oil pump and pumped around the engine and the water trying to act as a lubricant because it just won't, will not provide sufficient lubrication and protection of your surfaces for that. So we have to think about, uh, key, key ones would be thinking about the water, thinking about corrosion, thinking about emulsion, and then thinking about pre-ignition. Yeah. And my understanding of flame temperature and flame speed mm -hmm. are different as well. Yeah, the flame temperature is, is hotter for hydrogen compared to other fuels. Uh, flame speeds faster and quenching distance is shorter. So uh, that means we have to optimize our spark timing, but we also need to think about whole combustion chamber is going to be under more thermal stress. And how do we deal with that from a lubricant standpoint? Well, we need to make sure that it's uh, robust against oxidation. And so uh, oxidation properties of the oil and also nitration as well is going to be really important for hydrogen engine. Yeah, okay. and, and I guess for anyone who's not aware, so like the way that I'd kind of describe it, oxidation, you're adding oxygen to the molecules. Mm. Nitration, you're adding nit nitrogen to the molecules. Obviously, nitration tends to be a little bit more rare because it's triple bonded to itself, so you need more energy to break it apart mm. to get it to stick to the molecules in the first place. Um, but with the higher flame temperature, yeah. then you've got more energy in the system to be able to break apart the nitrogen that's in the air Absolutely. As part of the combustion process, right? Yeah, so okay. we've got a hotter temperature, so more energy to cause this oxidation. And I think a good rule of thumb is for like every 10 degrees hotter that your oil experiences, your oxidation doubles. Yeah. Uh, so I think maybe this is like a nice little sort of sidebar in terms of the chemistry. Everyone, I always say that in our industry, uh, we're not very creative. And when we want to tackle a problem, we just name the solution after the problem. So if you if you have a problem with oxidation, then you use oxidation inhibitors, mm -hmm. right, to, to deal with the problem. Um, there's not really a specific class of additives which are used to deal with nitration, or at least not, not a well-known one, mm -hmm. right? So what do, what do we actually use in the oil chemistry to deal with nitration? So oxidation and nitration are very much linked in how they work, and so often you'd use your antioxidants, but they would also serve as... Anti-nitration, there you go. I've not yeah. used that term before. Truly <laughs> a multifunctional <laughs> additive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who, knew? who knew? Okay, so so predominantly we're having to deal with higher temperatures, which would otherwise, if we didn't compensate for it in the additive package, you end up with shorter oil burning intervals. How about like dealing with water? So um, presumably, okay, water, you've already mentioned thermal strength issues that you can run into. Mm. Um, presumably, corrosion is going to become a bigger issue so how, how are we i mean you could just load up with corrosion inhibitors but i suspect that that's not what the right way of going about it corrosion inhibitors is absolutely a good solution um you need to be careful of which ones you're using as well but uh, what we tend to see with when we worked with oems is the corrosion's not happening when the engine is running and the oil is circulating and then you've got that, that oil film that's protecting the surface so corrosion tends to happen when that engine is in storage and not on for a while, so the oil is not circulating around. And so, uh, therefore, just the general humidity in the crankcase is then causing this attack on the surfaces, it causing some pretty rusty engines. So we need some sort of corrosion inhibitor or surface active molecule that's not only gonna protect the surface when there's oil flow in, but it's also gonna stick to the surface and provide a long lasting kind of coating or film that's, that mainly protects us from corrosion. Yeah, right. Okay, and then how about like sort of um, philosophy on formulation? And I, when I say that in terms of dealing with water, so let's say for example in the hydraulics world, probably the big split between mobile versus fixed plant is whether you want your oil to emulsify or demulsify, mm. right? And it's kind of like the how are you going to deal with the water? So how are we kind of how are we going about solving that problem? 
Um, so for us at Afton, we've we've looked at this and um, done a number of tests uh, over the last couple of years, uh, and really feel the best solution. I think, of course, from handling the water, but also for the OEM in terms of simplifying the hardware, is about emulsifying the water into the formulation. Um, if you think it's, you know, putting demulsifiers in and having the water separate at some stage, you're taking that out um, and having to find a system to do that, um, just, just that in complexity. In a world where we're trying to strip out complexity and actually, for a lot of things, Parsons RT can sim simplify the engine, uh, the, the total vehicle setup. So mm. I think we'd be going in the wrong direction if they. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. So then maybe. Um... If we could compare with a, a uh, sort of like a, a hydrogen ready engine oil mm -hmm. versus like a diesel, mm -hmm. a standard diesel engine oil that everyone's very, very familiar with. Um, you know, if I want to go from diesel to hydrogen, what 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 are some of the changes that I'm making on the chemistry side, uh, and how am I how am I going about that? So yeah, the key points we've spoken about is water handling and pre-ignition. So those are the two kind of things you want to think about here. So a diesel uh, designed oil would give you issues with corrosion and emulsion and possibly a pre-ignition depending on how it's designed. And so that's what you're focusing on from moving one to the other. There are also uh, elements where we have less requirement on the oil going from diesel to hydrogen, uh, particularly around cleanliness, for example, because we're not burning any carbon in our fuel so that we have less chance for incomplete combustion and then carbon deposits getting into oil and such. So then you have the option to simplify your oil and skinny it down, remove some of the dispersancy of the oil when you're moving to a hydrogen. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that uh, ultimately we're looking for like a hydrogen dedicated kind of formulation, right? Yes, I'd say there are, you know, you can see there are flexibility arguments for going for a pure agnostic solution, but I think when you go dedicated to hydrogen, you get a focused solution that targets just the problems that hydrogen need. When you're designing for wider range of applications, you're always making compromises. And so if you target your application, then you're able to be more focused. Cool. And you guys have something that's like commercially ready, right? Uh, yeah, we're very excited. We've just launched our, our new dedicated uh, hydrogen additive package uh, for for uh, hydrogen combustion engines, which is uh, the world's first, actually, we believe, to be commercially available. Um, it's been built on some of the fantastic work that Tara and the rest of the team have been have been doing the last couple of years, uh, and really wrestling with that idea of do we need something dedicated or is it fuel agnostic? And I think there's the space for both to be honest with you. Um, some of we will favour this idea that actually we want the flexibility to chop and change, and others maybe more from a sort of technical superiority wanting to really lead in this field. Um, you know, they want to lead with hardware, oh. put the best engine oil in as well, and the best engine oil is going to be something that is designed bespoke for hydrogen rather than making compromises. So yes, it's been quite an exciting journey for us to to go on and see what we can. You know, it, it's rare for us to you know in a world that you know driven by specifications. It's quite exciting. It's been a while where you can actually go out and try things and, and work with OEMs and other partners in the industry to see what's possible. Yeah, so that's interesting because uh, you, you've got a commercially available product, but there, you, there are no specs, right? Because no specs exist. It's not like you've chosen to come out with a non-spec oil. It's that there are no specs mm -hmm. out there. Is that something that's in active development as part of, like, let's say, for example, people know the SC sequences. Will there be potentially a separate a CR? I don't know, maybe like sequence H, right? <laughs> no, the, no, not 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 in the sense of the engine test, but uh, you know, you've got your A, B, C, and E E types. Is there going to be like a I don't know an H? Is that is that a discussion that's being had or within the industry? I think it's something that uh, I'm sure there are discussions around specifications happening, uh, and it has to be at some point. You have to get to a point where you've got a minimum standard. You know, that's what a CO was bought in for yeah. as a minimum standard. So we do need to see that. Um, but I think at this stage, so much of it is in the OEM hands, um, and it makes sense to be uh, for OEMs to be pretty trying this because a lot of what we've been working on in the last couple of years, we've seen is application variability. Hardware, you know, you can you can engineer out some of these problems as well. So it it will make it challenging to design a spec when actually there's so much difference. At the moment. You probably need to get to a point where there's a bit more 
clarity on the future, I would say. Mm. When you say engineering out some of the problems, like some of that's going to be pushed onto the OEM as well, mm-hmm. right? So um, let's say, for example, the things that come to mind is if you're going to run into issues with corrosion, then there's plenty of substitutes that we can do on the material side for you know corrosion-resistant materials. Um, is there anything else that they can or should be looking at? Let's say, for example, to solve the pre-ignition issue? Yeah, that's something that um, you can solve with the engineering. If you adjust your compression ratios, you can uh, reduce your proclivity for pre-ignition. And some OEMs have taken that strategy. Um, some OEMs are prioritizing other things, and so therefore they still have the pre-ignition, pre-ignition issue, and so they're looking for the oil to kind of solve that. Yeah, and I guess that's always the issue with uh, lubricant formulations. You're trying to... It sounds wrong to say you're appealing to the lowest common denominator, right? But, <laughs> but you're, you're having to formulate for everyone's technology stack, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Really interesting. Um, and just in terms of like the future, um, what do you see is like the next evolution with, uh, I guess, both hydrogen engines, but also the lubricant formulations? So I think there's still OEMs are understanding exactly what strategy they're going to take with the how they're going to put their engines together, what they're going to engineer out, what they want from the oil. So over the next few years, we expect to see a lot more development on that side. And then we work closely with the OEMs to try and best solve the problems they need us to solve. Awesome. Anything else? I think think it's back to that thing around um, moving to some form of specification somewhere um, and, and, and an agreement. And it may not be even a specification, but at least agreeing on the right tests. Yeah. some things things you know and we all have our views on which tests are the best um, and actually as an industry coming together across OEMs actually companies all companies to agree what is the right approach um, I don't always think you necessarily need a spec you know I deal with fuels as well where we've got testing but as there isn't generally specifications you know every customer is doing things differently in that world so we shouldn't be afraid of that but you do need to kind of have some commonality to the testing so I think that's that's really the next step we've, we've all got kind of solutions coming through and we're excited about them. Um, how do we, how do we, how do we start comparing them on a kind of level playing field? Yeah. That's awesome. Well, um, thanks so much to the two of you for coming to, to chat all things hydrogen. Um, I think, you know, hydrogen is one of those things that we've been hearing about for like a decade and it feels like it's always been in the future. So it's really cool to hear about things that are actually happening like now. Um, and obviously like products, which are now commercial, um, and can actually like go into real engines. So, um, yeah, very excited to see what the future brings. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.